Hey, Stephanie. Can you hear me? Oh, it sounds you're still connecting to audio. I think you're muted. Still muted. No, <laughs> still uh -huh. no. There we go. Yeah. It's because there's like there's a mute button on this that I press accidentally, and then I like I can't tell if I'm muted or not. All right, cool. Hi, Isaac. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Sorry. Um, there's a little bit of delay. We were having trouble getting this going in the room that we usually have it in, so I ended up just coming down to where my office is, and it seems to work now. So hopefully, sure. no more technical issues. <laughs> no problem. So looks like they got it going in that other room since people are being admitted in. So, so I'll introduce you once we admit everybody in and then um, make sure you have sharing capabilities. I think I just turned that on. Yeah, I'll go ahead and share this. Um, okay. uh, that. Oh, okay. Has it moved? Looks like it's working. Uh, yeah, the dual screens with presenting on Zoom sometimes. I'm never quite sure where I'm looking. So, okay, there we go. Yeah. And I'm going to check in with the other students in the other room real quick. Yeah, we still have technical issues in the other room. Sorry, Stephanie. So for everybody who just joined, uh, we're just going to go ahead and wait for uh, one more account to log in. There's, uh, we're actually hosting the event. We're actually gonna host the event in, in person as well with the showing virtually. And there seems to be trouble getting them logged in. So uh, we'll just wait for them to log in so that the people in person can see and watch the, the, uh, the talk as well, and then we'll get started. Maybe in the meantime, while we wait, Stephanie, um, if you're if there's no clearance issues with the Utah Geologic Survey, maybe there's some projects that are going on right now that are cool to talk about. Sure, I can talk about the picture, my cover picture. Actually, I ha I've gotten really used to just using this as a generic photo, and I was just looking at it, thinking like, oh yeah, that is a good picture. Um, this is actually. So there's a lot of funding going on for critical minerals at the moment, a lot of it coming from uh, federal USGS down to the state surveys. And so we have some funding to do both a, like a bedrock mapping study, so literally like a geologic mapping quad, as well as 
a mineral resource assessment from a critical mineral standpoint of the Gold Hill Mining District, which is in Western Utah, Western Tooele County. Um, so for those who have been in that beautiful part of the country, um, it's just like an hour south of Wendover. Um, and it's, it's a really fascinating district. So we've got, there's about three, probably four pulses of mineralization. Um, the very first pulse is associated with the Jurassic granite diorite. And that's actually what I've got on the screen right there. So it's the copper gold tungsten scarn, um, mainly endoscarn occurring in the granite diorite itself, even though the granite diorite is emplacing into carbonate country rock. And so this just like the mineral textures of this are so beautiful. I'm actually, I, this is, I'm gonna stand up because I have a sample from it. Um, oh, if you can see this massive, beautiful, just like actinolite all altering um, to muscovite as well. So, I mean, the mineralogy out there is stunning and there's very clear overprinting textures. There's a late phase where you can see the copper sulfides mobilizing into exotic copper oxide and literally going down the C axis of the actinolite um, and then that is associated with just big, beautiful, gaudy molly crystals. Um, so it's just, and I mean, that's just the one scar. That's, that's only one pulse of mineralization. So it's really, um, it's been a really interesting, fantastic study and really fun to get out there. This is definitely the best mine dump I've ever been to. And I've been to a lot of mine dumps. Um, so yeah, so we're working on that. We've got um, a master's student down at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, who's helping us out. Um, yeah, I mean, I can talk about this project for a long time, but I don't want to <laughs> go too far off base. <laughs> that, that worked. We, uh, we got our audience, the rest of our audience in. And thanks for sharing that. That's, that's a really cool sample right there. I'm really jealous. <laughs> I, I have had some good sampling runs the past year for some reason. I have, yeah, got some, got some good ones lately. <laughs> that's great. Uh, so since we have our full audience, I'll go ahead and introduce you, Stephanie, and then, uh, I'll give you the floor to, to, to give your talk. So Stephanie Mills is a senior geologist with the Energy and Minerals Program at the Utah Geologic Survey. She started with the UGS or UT Ge Utah Geological Survey in January, 2019, and is an economic geologist specialized in metallic mineral resources. She got her bachelor's of science honors from University of Texas, Austin in 2009, and then her, did her PhD at Monash University in Australia in 2014. Uh, Stephanie has over a decade of experience researching and working with mineral exploration across the globe, and she specializes in magmatic hydrothermal systems, focusing on porphyry, SCARN, uh, replacement style deposits, Carlin style deposits as well. Uh, she's a registered professional geologist, and she's a fellow with the SEG, and she's also part of the recently established DE&I committee with SEG, which is how I know Stephanie. So uh, I'll give you the floor. I'm excited for your talk. Thanks for, thanks for your time. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm actually really excited about this talk. I will say I talk about critical minerals a lot, but this is one of the first chances I've had to kind of share some of my thinking around critical mineral exploration. Um, so I'm a survey geologist. I've been, as Isaac said, I've been at the UGS since 2019, but I am still an explorationist at heart. So this is a topic that's, uh, that's very near and dear to me. Um, so we'll get started. Just a quick, um, just a little blurb about the Utah Geological Survey, kind of where I come from. So um, this is the values of the Utah Geological Survey. And I just wanted to share that um, excellence, integrity, and objectivity in everything we do. So we're an independent scientific body um, for the state of Utah. Um, so everything I do is independent of all of the craziness going on at state and federal levels. We're very focused on the science and the geology that goes on within our state. So that's the kind of position that I'm presenting from. And just one more plug for Utah while I'm at it. <laughs> um, we do have some publications related to critical minerals and just Utah's mining industry in general. A summary of the critical minerals of Utah that myself and the other economic geologists at the survey, Andrew, who's an industrial minerals geologist, um, we put that out in 2020. And then every year we put out, a um, not a survey, sorry, a uh, publication of what's been going on in the mining and exploration sector for Utah for the year. We're very behind on getting the 2021 out, but that should be out soon. And then 2021 coming at some point. All right, so getting started with critical minerals, I'm just gonna start with establishing a baseline so that we all know what we're talking about and that we're all on the same page because the language in this 
sector has gotten very complicated. And that's actually why I wanted to start with this fig figure, because I think they've actually done an admirable job of trying to graphically show how complex the conversation of what subgroups all of these elements fall into and overlap with. Um, this is a really good figure. Although I will say the funny thing about this figure is it's not accurate for the United States because this is a figure from Canada and their definition of critical minerals is different than ours. So to start with, what is a critical mineral? Um, critical minerals are actually a defined list. So whereas things like battery metals or magnets, metals, things like that, future metals, green energy metals, those are kind of open to interpretation, typically kind of a um, industry interpretation. Critical minerals is defined by the federal government. In this case, it's defined by the US Geological Survey. So critical minerals are things that are essential to the um, domestic economy and security. The supply chain is susceptible to vulnerability and the absence of these things would cause a significant disruption to economy or um, defense. So the initial critical minerals list from the US Geological Survey was published in 2018 and it had 35 mineral commodity groups, mineral commodities or groups on it. They also have written into kind of the, well, I don't know, legislation around critical minerals to review this list every three years. So in 2021, there was an update. And so just to make the point again, the US critical minerals are um, independent of those from say like Canada and Australia. So I'm only gonna talk about US critical minerals from here on out. This figure is a summary of basically what has happened um, with the US critical minerals list. So every element that is in green was originally included in the 2018 critical mineral list. Those that are in blue have been dropped as of 2021 updates and those in red have been added. So this was, uh, the 2021 update was not particularly welcome from Utah because they dropped um, four elements that we actually had. So now our, now our production of critical minerals doesn't look as impressive, but we do have good uh, resources of zinc. So we were happy to see zinc added to the list. Um, and so from now on, this is kind of the baseline for critical minerals that I'll work from for the rest of the presentation. And if there's any glaring questions, like I've completely left people in the dust, maybe just speak up because I do talk about this a lot and sometimes maybe I get a little bit into my own head. Okay, I did wanna take one step back from critical minerals to talk about this concept of the green energy or carbon neutral energy transition. Most of the significant battery metals, things like lithium and cobalt are critical minerals but there's a significant number of metal resources that are necessary for these kind of energy transitions that are not critical minerals. So I've highlighted those with the red air. This figure is from uh, the World Bank. Actually, I thought this was a really cool figure. They call it, um, gosh, how do they phrase it? The mineral intensity of different energy solutions. So the commodities are on the upper axis in black and the energy solution, so the energy source is on the, um, on the right-hand side in white. And the reason that I like to bring this up is actually primarily because of copper, because obviously copper is not a critical mineral. We have a lot of domestic production, for example, but copper is essential to any sort of energy transition. So it's very easy to get caught up in the headspace of critical minerals being the future, but we need to remember that there are some very significant commodities that we already produce that are traditional um, commodities we've produced for a long time that are still going to be essential. Um, so silver, molybdenum, lead, and iron, I'm not sure how well everyone can read it, are the, are the other ones that are kind of singled out in this graph that are not critical minerals. And just as a side note, nothing I've talked about so far takes into consider industrial minerals. So for example, aggregate. And I'm gonna step out of this presentation just really quickly. And I'm gonna to come to this visualization. Um, it's all of the minerals in the world produced in one year. And I'm gonna scroll relatively quickly because there's just kind of a, a point I wanna make. So this is, you know, silver. Okay, we're at silver. That's how much is produced in a year. Vanadium. All right, we're gonna keep going. Molybdenum, that's kind of familiar. All right, now we're stepping up into larger quantities. Nickel here, um, you know, here we go. Copper, that's how much copper is produced in, a world, in the world. We're gonna keep going. Okay, so now we're getting into some of the bulk commodities like lime, bauxite. Keep going, keep going. Iron ore, yep, obviously a lot of iron ore. 
and now cement. And then finally, so sand and gravel. And this is basically aggregate. So I'm going to scroll, 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 scroll. I'm going to keep scrolling. And down here, I want to point out we're still only halfway there. So we we use a lot of aggregate. And you know, my heart doesn't really sit with, with industrial minerals, but I always feel like it's important for people to understand just how essential that is to our economy and future as well. All right, I'm gonna jump back into this presentation now. Okay. So now let's get to the meat of what I really like talking about exploration. So number one, how do we explore for critical minerals? And I'm actually gonna go ahead and take us a step back and say that our first question actually should be, do we need to explore for critical minerals? The nature of critical minerals is that a lot of these have been identified as weak points, but one, that doesn't mean that there's actually a danger to them. A lot of things were completely import reliant on come from, for example, Australia or Canada. Those aren't necessarily weak points because those are very stable countries that we have a good trade relationship with. Also, a lot of critical minerals occur as byproducts and we don't explore for them as primary core commodities. So, you know, they're, they're just not gonna be the focus of an exploration program. Um, so the economics, the need, the supply, the demand, as well as how is this produced, these are significant things we need to look at before we even consider the question of whether we're exploring for them or not. And I think, I think it's the next slide. I tried to, nope, tried to figure out where to put it in. Um, I mentioned it some elsewhere a little bit farther down the line, but lots of these things, geology is not the issue. Processing is the issue. Um, the bottleneck sits more downstream in the mining chain. And, um, oh, and then the other thing being that a lot of critical minerals, the future of how we're gonna extract them doesn't even come from a primary geologic resource. It's gonna come from mine waste, um, waste rock from tailings, from mill waste, things like that. We're gonna remine old waste. So there is a lot of economics that goes into considering, like that gets considered before we even step into the realm of exploration. Um, but I wanted, to, so I kind of wanted to highlight that we have a lot of questions we need to ask before we even get to exploration. So that's kind of the next slide. So this is an example. These are three critical minerals. So we've got beryllium. Um, for those of you who don't know, beryllium is a very lightweight, um, but uh, strong, excuse me, sorry, we've had a cold rampage through my household, <laughs> so I'm a little, a little congested still. Um, beryllium is essential to the defense and aerospace industry because it's a very lightweight metal that can withstand um, kind of the thermal and mechanical contortions of, of aerospace and space travel. It's a very stable market. Um, so for example, the reason I've got beryllium here as an example is Utah is the global leader for beryllium production, believe it or not. 65% um, of global production came from, of beryllium production came from Utah in 2020. And that's actually why it's a critical mineral. It's not an import reliance. It's a single point of failure. That's what the SPOF is. So there's a risk of a single point of failure of the supply chain. Um, but so for example, this uh, deposit, the Spore Mountain deposit, in Juab County in Utah has been in continuous production since 1968, and they still have 75 years of mine life left at current production levels. So it's a very stable market. Um, it hasn't, doesn't really go through the swings. Um, yeah, exactly. And also there's, they, the ore is also refined and processed in the US. It's not shipped overseas at any point. So that's beryllium. Then we've got scandium which uh, scandium has niche industrial applications. It's an alloy that goes into, um, it, it's an additive in aluminum alloys to help make things lighter. I wanna say I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, it also has a relatively stable market. The price has been consistent over the past five years. It doesn't experience large screen, uh, swings. It is produced exclusively as a byproduct. So this is not something that can be explored for, or well, not something that is the economics currently support exploring for as a primary commodity. We are 100% import reliant, however, with Europe and China being the leading suppliers. And then the last example I wanted to give was indium. So indium is essential for what's called ITO thin film coatings, uh, indium tin oxide. 
So indium tin oxide is clear and electrically conductive, which makes it ideal for touchscreens. I don't think it's the touchscreens actually on like our phones, but it's touchscreens on like LCD, so maybe computers, um, flat panel displays, things like that. But it is uh, highly, highly essential to um, basically to our high tech economy. Um, and it has a much more variable market. It is a byproduct of zinc mi mining. So again, uh, not, a, not a primary commodity. And we are 100% import reliant with China and Canada being the main suppliers for the US. So if we approach these three minerals from an exploration standpoint and say, ask that question again, do we even need to explore for these? And I should also clarify that from here on out, this is, you know, this is kind of my opinion. Everything I was presenting previously is, you know, uh, USGS has defined, or, yeah, USGS has defined critical minerals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're getting now into more kind of what I, this is my view on the industry and how we should approach things. So I would say, no, we don't need to explore for beryllium realistically. The market is very stable and we have a very large resource already sitting on domestic soil. We do not need to go further with this. Scandium, we also don't need to explore for one, because it's a byproduct and two, because we have um, a good source from friendly partners and three, because the market is very stable. We're not looking at a huge explosion in demand like we are with things say lithium and cobalt. Indium is the one that I would say, yes, we actually could focus on this as an exploration um, target. Again, we can't focus or traditionally we don't focus on this as a primary target. And I'm going to get to that as we talk about how to explore. Um, but, you know, given the variable market, the likelihood of expansion, because it is so essential to high tech um, devices, um, our import reliance, even though we do say from Canada, we do have friendly import partners. Um, I would still say that India makes for a really good exploration target, or at least a robust exploration target. Okay, so this is where I said it. Um, keeping in mind what I referred to earlier, it does not matter how good a geology, a geological deposit is, that cannot solve downstream processing bottlenecks. So there is only so much we can do in our role as exploration geologists. So what I'm going to do from now on is basically show how we can do the best job to our ability within our realm. And then, I don't know, there's other people who have to fix the downstream stuff. That's <laughs> We're not metallurgists at the end of the day. So. so getting to the meat of it, how do we explore for critical minerals? Um, and I use the term monolith just because of how the term critical minerals gets leveraged. We talk about it as if it's one thing and not made up of 30 plus mineral commodities that span every geologic terrain practically on earth. Um, so we can't really talk realistically about exploring for critical minerals. That's kind of a, I mean, that's not really a thing, right? The critical minerals need to be treated individually. And that's a very difficult thing to do, especially because the other challenges, they're usually not the core commodity of a mineral deposit. And, um, yeah, and so they're usually minor constituents and things that are mined for other core commodities. So we're looking at things that are not the main focus and that occur across geologic terrains. So how on earth are we supposed to contextualize this for our brains to fit around and figure out how do we explore for this? Luckily, the USGS, being the wonderful geologists that they are, has made some really great steps towards this. Um, now what they've done, there's kind of two ways to think about this. There's the mineral systems approach, and that's what I'm gonna talk about. They have a very uh, codified mineral system approach that they've established because that makes their life easy when they're having to look across the United States and bin all of these different geologic terrains in likelihood of their production of critical minerals. There's also the mineral system approach that would be less codified, which is like, let's just think about this from a geological perspective and what could possibly be there. I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more detail. But basically, the mineral system approach looks at, and I'll just read this, this is from the report that I'm citing here, how ore deposits that contain critical minerals form and relate to broader geologic frameworks and the tectonic history of the earth. So we're trying to have a holistic view of how mineral systems interact both with the geology and tectonic framework of an overall regional setting, and plus, then the second quote, mineral systems are much larger than individual ore deposits, and they generally have geologic features that can be imaged by the topographic, geologic, geochemical, and geophysical mapping techniques. 
So what's that saying is we're also looking at a whole, again, holistic, this is kind of the word that will recur over and over, at a holistic view of an entire mineral producing setting. And what are the ore deposits that are in there? How do the critical minerals sit within that? And also, first of all, how do we explore for those? Because we still have to have a way of exploring. And I know that this might all sound arm wavy, I promise we'll get to some concrete examples and we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. Um, but I just wanted to set the stage with basically question and answer, how do we explore for critical minerals? The answer is we use a mineral system approach. And I'm gonna keep going with the USGS critical, um, yeah, critical minerals mineral system approach because um, there is a publication that we can all refer to. So it's a good kind of central source of knowledge to at least start working from. This is a figure, so this figure is actually from the report, from the USGS report, but I think it is probably also very, very familiar to most people. This is like the penultimate figure from Silito 2010 from the Porphyry Copper Paper um, seminal publication, really. So this figure comes up all the time. And what this does is this shows us essentially the mineral system associated with porphyry copper. So it's not just the porphyry copper. <laughs> Oh, excuse me, I'm so sorry. It's not just the porphyry copper deposit. It also includes scarn and replacement and lithocap and epithermal and everything that kind of sits within the mineral system. So if you were struggling to kind of understand what I meant when I was saying mineral system versus ore deposit, I hope that this can help you understand. When we look at the whole figure, this refers to the mineral system. And then when we look at individual deposits, say the SCARN, that is the individual, yeah, that's the individual ore deposit. Um, the changes that they made to this figure for the USGS publication is they basically started listing out some of the critical minerals that are commonly found in these different ore deposit types. Um, so, you know, carbonate replacement, that's a really common, especially here in Utah, we have tons of carbonate replacement deposits. And there's a gamut of critical minerals that we can consider when we're looking at carbonate replacement, carbonate replacement deposits, excuse me. So basically, um, you know, I'm kind of going ahead and showing my cards at this point, exploring for critical minerals, this isn't so much about doing something different than we already do when we approach a project from an exploration standpoint. What it's about is taking a more holistic view and considering the entire mineral potential of a system, even if we've come in looking at a few core commodities, what is the rest of the system that we can consider? And I think that this, the thing that I like about that approach to critical minerals is it kind of echoes what's going on across our mining industry as a whole. We're looking at more and more, how do we get the most out of things that we've already mined? Um, you know, it's fine that we're gonna need to dig more holes in the future. We are gonna need future resources, but let's look at the holes we've already dug. What else can we get out of them? You know, Bingham Canyon, they're, they've been in production for over 110 years continuously, and they're just now adding a tellurium recovery stream. So, I mean, there's still potential for things that have been going for years and years and years. We just have to change the way that we look at them and the way that we approach these mineral deposits. Okay, so at risk of still sounding slightly arm wavy, <laughs> I'm gonna bring us into a specific mineral system and give an example of how we can put this in practice. So this is the West Desert deposit in Utah. You might notice the theme of where I'm selecting examples from. Um, the West Desert Deposit is in Central Juab County. You can see it, uh, the, the left figure is the regional map. So for those of you who don't know Utah, Salt Lake City is kind of in the upper right-hand corner and the West Desert Project is in the middle of nowhere. So it's on the Western flank of the Fish Springs Range, if that helps orient anyone. The second figure shows the kind of regional geologic map of the Fish Springs Range. So that's a Paleozoic set of um, carbonate basement rocks, the carbonate and and uh, ugh, and sedim politic sedimentary rocks. There we go. The area that the ore deposit is located is cut by a west-northwest trending normal fault with significant displacement. And there's also been an Eocene quartz monsonite that's intruded kind of along that fault. So you can. Um, are you all able to see my mouse on the presentation screen? Yeah, we can see it. Ah, oh, perfect. Okay. 
So the Eocene intrusion is these small red bodies here. This is the Juab fault cutting through the northern end of the range there. And as would be familiar for most people who've worked with SCARNs, you obviously at Colorado School of Mines have Xiaoshan, a SCARN expert, so I don't think I'm telling too many people things they've never seen. As is familiar, the Eocene intrusion has come in along the Juab fault and the carbonate basement rocks have basically um, altered or metasomatized to SCARN. So the green color is their silicate SCARN and then there's various, they've got it coated in different colors that even I have trouble seeing. So there's magnetite, zinc and copper that they've shown here, the magnetite being purple, uh, the zinc being red and the copper being green. So this is the cop uh, zinc copper deposit is the way they define it. Stephanie, sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt. Uh, the okay. uh, audience, live can't really see your mouse it's it's a bit small would could you try okay. changing to a laser pointer maybe that that might work better are you able to tell me how to change it to a laser pointer <laughs> yeah i think if you right click if it's powerpoint if not like, um, uh, it's google uh, sorry it's google slides um okay. oh wait re remote control is that it nope Oh, hold on. Spotlight. You can see a pencil now if you want to draw. I think you can draw on your PowerPoint now. Okay. Let's see what happens. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Was, wow. I have to say, was... I've never done that before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Excuse me. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so the red here, kind of these, and, and, you know, because this is country rock altering, this isn't like a clean, nice, beautiful ore body. This is obviously fingers of metasomatism that have likely gone long bedding into these uh, Paleozoic carbonate basement rocks. Um, so the red being the zinc body, the green, say kind of around here, being the, um, the copper ore body, and then the purple magnetite scarn is kind of at these front ends here. And this is the pogonip group. Um, so, okay, so now I have to figure out how to change the slide. Oh, wait, oh, well now, clear, sorry. Mm. Got it. <laughs> All right, thanks for bearing with me. Um, okay, so that was the overall geology view. Um, it's very it's probably very familiar to a lot of people who've worked in the kind of magmatic hydrothermal setting and scarf setting, right? So if we then take a step back to this USGS publication um, that I'm using as kind of a touchstone during this talk and look at how we can utilize this mineral system approach for West Desert, um, the overall mineral system, as I just alluded to, or as I used as an example previously, they have a ton of mineral systems, but I'm going to stick in my lane of porphyries because that's where I'm comfortable. Um, so the mineral system is porphyry, copy, copper, moly, gold. And you can see that in the first column on the left. And then, you know, they give an example of like, how does this system work? But then in the second column, I can, I've already forgotten how I did it before. Hmm. In the third column, you can see that they've now listed out the different deposits, so specifically deposit types that fall within a porphyry copper uh, mineral system. And porphyry copper being one of those deposit types, but um, the deposit type that we're working within the SCARN, this West Desert SCARN, is, uh, falls better into the category of polymetallic sulfide. And then the, the letters that they've got there are SCARN replacement vein in intermediate sulfide, uh, inter intermediate sulfidation. So we're working in a SCARN setting. So polymetallic SCARN, I'm just gonna say, and the fourth column shows major core commodities that are often associated with this. And, you know, first thing, copper and zinc, bang on. That's exactly what we're seeing in the SCARN, even though it's a zinc copper SCARN. Um, so we're already, you know, yeah, we're well in the correct mineral system and ore deposit type. The fifth column is basically the column that then would tell you what kind of critical mineral potential we could theoretically expect to see there. Um, and you can see within that column, there are some that are bolded. That's where they say there's a demonst demonstrable um, ore deposit somewhere in the world producing that critical mineral as a byproduct. So for example, 
um, porphyry, copper, having PGE, tellurium, rhenium, uranium, and scandium, that might, except for the scandium, but definitely those first four, that could be Bingham Canyon. Bingham Canyon has produced all of those things. So that's an example. For our example of the West Desert polymetallic scarn, we're looking at manganese, germanium, gallium, indium, bismuth, antimony, arsenic, tungsten, and tellurium as the possible um, as the possible critical mineral byproduct commodities. So when we look back at West Desert and say, well, how does that actually fall in line with what we're seeing geologically on the ground? As it turns out, the West Desert has an established resource of indium, which is exactly what was predicted in the table that we just saw. So the West Desert is, now I get to talk about how cool it is because I really like this deposit. The West Desert deposit is really cool. Indium is replacing in the sphalerite lattice up to 9% by weight. That, um, I think they mentioned in their technical report that they don't know anywhere else that indium is actually substituting into sphalerite at such a high level. So it's a significant amount of indium that's sitting in this deposit. And the example on the left is just showing that there's so much indium, they've actually modeled it out. And its shape is very similar to that of what we see for the zinc and the copper, that you're getting um, a lot of indium accumulated right at the interface with the intrusive country rock, and that then it is penetrating along the country rock, along bedding, essentially. Um, so, and, and just a little bit more about the indium, because... Why not? And um, this is the only established resource of indium known in the United States. And this deposit alone contains enough indium to cover the US's indium imports for over 15 years, according to the established resource, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So I really like this example because it's a very, it's a very familiar type of ore deposit to many of us. And it really demonstrates how when they looked at this deposit holistically, they were able to do a really amazing thing and actually establish a resource of one of the critical minerals. And this was done in 2014. Critical minerals weren't on the chart. 2014 was like a terrible year in the exploration industry and they still managed to do this. So I, I really like the way that this kind of plays along with what we're seeing evolve in the critical minerals realm uh, currently. And yeah, so this is just how I've already, I've gotten ahead of myself and already talked about this slide, but essentially this is the, um, indicated and inferred, there's no measured. So it's just INI resource. And um, they have an oxide and sulfide resource established. And this is established in 2014. And you can see the indium um, indicated here, total inferred there. Um, so yeah, supplying the US for 15 years. So just going back to what I mentioned before about how do we explore for critical minerals? Well, you know, we kind of don't explore for critical minerals realistically. I mean, some of them, lithium, sure. Some of them are uh, important enough that we can consider them core commodities, but that's really the minority of critical minerals. And it's really kind of the rest that we're talking about today, the backwaters of the periodic table, I heard someone say, and I think that was a great phrase. Um, we're basically doing what we do already, but we're teaching ourselves to have a more holistic view and to consider things not as an isolated ore deposit sitting in some setting of the crust. We're looking at things holistically from a mineral system perspective and holistically from a commodity perspective, realizing that there's probably potential to some of these things that we've never really paid much attention to other than as pathfinders before. So this is kind of the last bit. I'm a, so for me, I'm a person where if, if a problem is put in front of me, I immediately want to like take tangible steps to solve it. So when you put this question of how do we explore for critical minerals in front of me, I immediately want to start thinking of the steps that you would take when you're boots on the ground doing an exploration project. And this is what a lot of what I did before I started at the, um, at the industry, at the survey. Um, so what can we do right now, today, in pursuit of critical minerals exploration? Um, and I use <laughs> the ostrich picture kind of along the theme of like, we can take our heads out of the sand and look more holistically. But what are some of the actual ways that we do that other than just saying like, look at it holistically, don't you know what I'm talking about? What are the actual ways that we do this? So number one, run multi-element assay throughout the exploration process. <laughs> and um, those of you who work for major companies are probably like, yeah, of course. Those of you who've ever worked for a junior, 
are like, oh, that's expensive. Um, and I understand that, right? It, it, ALS has done a good job of bringing down prices, but assays, multi-element assay can be really expensive, especially if you're a junior getting your fund day, funding from one day to the next. However, the multi-element assay provides us such a phenomenally strong baseline for doing everything else in the exploration process and everything else, and even the ore body knowledge, pre-feasibility, order of magnitude studies. This is a really important step to take in understanding the characteristic of our deposit. And it's important to take it early because it is very frustrating and difficult to go back and do this stuff later. And you would not believe how much legacy sample material just gets lost over the course of a project. So especially if a project changes hands, that's why I'm saying start this from the beginning, run the assays. Now, I and I use the term dirtbag explorer, um, just basically referring to like, if you're doing it on a very tight budget, one of the hacks that you can do is run less. So one in 10, one in 20, try and pick key samples that will um, basically characterize the, the mineralization types, the alteration types and the country rock types of your, of your exploration um, area of your ore body and run those smaller subset through multi-element and then you can calibrate a portable XRF which those are becoming very affordable or you can borrow one I mean that yeah these things are everywhere I, I have one if a, if a government geologist has one like you can find one um, calibrate a portable XRF against those samples that you have run get the pulps back calibrate your sample against it and then use that to at least establish some sort of analysis on the rest of your samples now that is going to be very difficult for some of the lighter elements, of course, but um, you know, lithium, for example, is probably going to be a core target anyway. So if you're doing lithium expiration, you need to analyze for that. Um, so that's, to me, this is like the number one step that an explorationist consider is like, let's just get the chemistry. Let's start with seeing what have we got. So the second step is analyzing and contextualizing those results. And when I say contextualizing, I'm thinking of a situation, say we've got the Colorado Plateau here in southeastern Utah. So somebody's out there doing sediment hosted copper exploration, and a geologist gets an assay back of, say, 700 ppm cobalt. Have you, is there zero cobalt? Is that completely useless? Have you found the next Congolese cobalt belt? Like, where are you in that the spectrum of like, is this useful information? And so, Getting the data is only the first step. Understanding what that data means is not a trivial next step, especially for critical minerals where they're not commonly taught. Half of us don't even know, like, I don't know, give me a number for scandium. I have no idea, man. So, you know, this is going to be a really difficult thing to do. Although I will point out that many um, critical minerals are actually pathfinders. So arsenic and antimony and carlin systems, tellurium, for example, and porphyry systems. So some of this, you should, you should be doing this anyway. I'm gonna take a, a, a sidestep from, from talking about what explorationists need to do and talk about maybe what everyone else needs to be doing. And when we talk about contextualizing these results, this is where academia, government and professional societies really need to step up and support industry because industry geologists do not have the time to go research what, uh, what baseline, what enrichment levels are gonna be for 33 mineral commodities, right? we need to make this information really available for them. And I'm thinking in terms of, if, if anyone else remembers, I wanna say it was maybe 2014, Scott Haley wrote this really um, useful article for SEG Discovery, I'm pretty sure. And he had a table in there that was like, this is crustal abundance of Pathfinder elements for porphyry. This is what you should consider enrichment or sort of maybe enriched. And this is what you should really consider enriched. And I mean, I printed that table out. I had that thing like taped to my computer screen while I was doing porphyry exploration because it was just like, oh, thank you. Somebody who can just give me just a little bit when I'm reading through an entire drill holes worth of assays. Like what, what is my eye trying to catch? Like, what am I looking for to try and understand if this is important or not? Um, and I think that basically trying to provide that contextualization in the critical minerals realm is is a really big part of what those of us supporting industry, kind of peripheral to industry, should look at doing. And this is just my own personal uh, soapbox that I'm gonna take a second to stand on. 
contextualizing results, even if you're not messing with critical minerals, you need the time to think critically and to think in terms of an entire mineral system and to maybe do even a tiny bit of research. And anyway, all of this requires time and exploration managers, if I could ask you for one thing, please, please give your geologists the time to do this. What I see happening a lot, especially on bigger exploration teams, is that there's a few key people who are like, well, those are the good, basically, those are the good geologists. And that's crap. Like everyone, I mean, I look at these teams and everyone's a good geologist. And it's just that there's these few key people who become the go-tos for interpretation while you're, you know, you've got some other geologists doing all your assay inventory and talking to ALS, whereas that geologist is just as good as a geologist, but doesn't have the time to dedicate to the geologizing. So what I would say is try and level the playing field on your exploration teams, give everyone a chance at this interpretation and give everyone the time. Because we talk about this like lack of discoveries and what are we gonna do for the future? And like, oh my gosh, what's happening? One of the big things is we have so much more data coming at us and that's great, but we still need the time to go through it. So that's, all right, that's the end of my soapbox, I promise. All right, so continuing kind of down the exploration timeline of how projects evolve and what can we do from a critical mineral standpoint. When you get to the 3D modeling stage, so I'm thinking like LeapFrog, for example, when you're building these structural models and deposit models and uh, geochemical models, go ahead and build the critical mineral enrichment polygons. If you have done your geochemistry, your multi-element geochemistry from the beginning, you have that data there. And if you've then done the contextualization to know like, okay, well, arsenic's looking a little useless, but you know, this antimony is really, you know, this is actually kind of high. Take the time to build these polygons. If, if you're already in the process of doing 3D modeling, yeah, of course, it's a bit of a time sink to add another element in for your modeling, but not nearly compared to what it's going to be if you have to go back and do it later on. And also, again, this is going to help you understand the ore body as a whole. This isn't just this isn't just a means to an end, a transactional approach to like, OK, well, this might make us some money. It's about understanding your rocks. And eventually, as I'm going to talk about the next thing, understanding your geomet, um, you know, we've really got to have a more long-term vision of our ore body knowledge accumulation um, and, and that that's gonna help us down the road basically and, and just keep us from doing a lot of rework as we suddenly decide, oh my gosh, wait, intimidy was important. Did anyone else know that intimidy was important? Okay, well, we've already done the work, so it's great. And I think this is kind of the last step that I wanted to talk about for exploration, because basically, if you're getting at the point of doing geomet studies, you're getting quite close to doing a pre-fees, um, or eventually you might be doing a pre-fees study anyway, and that's going to start bringing it in more to the mine geologists and more to the geometallurgists and the metallurgists, things like that. Um, but a really important thing is to not forget the importance of this like nexus point of geometallurgy. And I think this is kind of the recognition of how important this stage is, is, is kind of expanding. So we've got exploration here. We know what we've got. We know what our enrichment is, but we don't necessarily know how it's sitting. So for example, you get an indium result. Okay, is that indium in the talco pyrite? Is it in the magnetite? Is it in the salarite? Is it in the country rock? Like, where is this indium coming from? And so, you know, I know a lot of exploration geologists kind of poo poo geometallurgy, but I think it's so important. And also, I think it's so fascinating, but um, it's really essential for critical minerals because understanding where those critical minerals are sitting, of course, then impacts can we recover them in the processes that we're already considering for recovery? Where is it going to go? Is it going to go into waste rock? So, like, say you decide not to recover a critical mineral, that's fine, right? Like, the economics might not support it. But where is it going to be? If someone cares later, is it going to be in your waste rock? Is it going to be in your tailings that have gone to the mill? Is it going to be in the mill waste? Where, like, so where are these things going to be? And that's a really important question that we need to not forget to address um, as we go through the life cycle of ore bodies and deposits and mines. <laughs> and lastly, um, and I kind of just alluded to this anyway. But the last thing of what can we do today is document everything. 
it's very common for deposits to change hands multiple times for JVs to come in and someone takes over even if someone else owns it. And this geologist went to that company, but they were the only ones, they had that thing on their C drive, didn't they? I don't know, I lost it. Um, we, we, we need to do a better job of, of really doing a good job of documenting our ore body knowledge in a cohesive manner. You know, I worked at a major company and they had a really excellent internal system for, you know, this deposit has reached this stage of exploration and we are going to publish this level of document and it and then these are all of the subsets that we're going to fill in for this document and I to this day, I actually think that that was an amazing approach to making sure that even a, even a project we're going to drop, let's document it though, because we need to understand why we dropped it. And also if we can't pawn it off on someone else, we need to, you know, pawning it off on someone else is great. We get the money, but there's a certain social responsibility as well to helping them understand the potential, the holistic potential of this deposit and not putting them in a corner where they have to go do a bunch of rework that they might decide is too expensive or they don't have enough time for and then it doesn't get done and again we dig a hole without utilizing the entire breadth of the ore body so document everything there's variable ways to do this ideally the deposit will have a technical report a jork report or a 43101 report um, published and you know this is the information that can go in there. You don't have to model all of this up to indicated and inferred and inventory and measured, whatever. You don't actually have to model it to that degree. It's kind of hard to do that sometimes, but at least if you have captured the knowledge that you have done already, you have given the people coming after you such a great starting point for really, I mean, kind of respectful uh, exploitation of the deposit, essentially, um, you know, respecting our rocks and respecting what they can give us. That's probably a little airy fairy at this point. So I might just uh, go to the next slide. Ah, okay. I think I talked really fast. <laughs> I have three slides. I do know that this audience is not all students, but just um, in hopes that there are several students. I have a few, just these last three slides really quick, kind of talking about a little bit about my career and just some quick advice that I've picked up along the way. Um, as uh, Isaac said, when he introduced me, I did my undergraduate at UT and then moved to Australia. The first part of my career, I feel like I need to redo the slide because um, it looks like I didn't start working until I started at Fortescue. But I mean, from 2005, freshman year of geology, I started working as a lab tech and a field assistant. So I have been doing odd jobs uh, you know, underground mapping, field assistant, carrying equipment, cleaning people's <laughs> cleaning people's lab bottles, <laughs> um, sawing rocks, creating thin sections. Um, then when I went to Australia, I got to do more like babysitting rigs, logging RC chips, mapping, things like that. Um, and all of that was while I was still a student. So um, students, keep in mind, there's a lot of potential for you to get. And honestly, I probably learned more about the, how the industry works in, in those, or at least maybe how the exploration process works in those stages because I had so much exposure to projects all over the place. Um, and then I started kind of a more formal career from there. Um, and the, the, yeah, I guess the map at the bottom shows, I think the red dots are where I've worked, um, particularly in the US and Australia are the two areas I've worked in the most. And then the blue stars are areas that I've done projects for, um, but wasn't boots on the ground. Uh, so that's just a little bit about my background. I think in some ways I have a mix between a traditional and a non-traditional background. And I just uh, kind of want to let students know that there's a lot of ways to approach our industry and don't get locked into one model. Um, this is a lot of text. I will make these slides available for anyone who does want them. Um, basically, this is just kind of my comparison between looking at jobs in academia, industry, and government. I did do a PhD um, and worked as a research assistant, which isn't the same as as than like being a postdoc and going the academia route, but I have had exposure to that. Um, obviously I worked in industry for a while and I'm government now. So I understand kind of all of them have pros and cons and all of them are great and maybe at different times in your life. Um, so, you know, if anyone is interested in that. And my last slide, this is just <laughs> the advice that I've learned the hard way. And I, you know, I'd be interested to see if some of the other professional geologists on the call agree. Um, first thing, and I did learn this the hard way, no job is worth your health or your happiness um, and you're gonna be fine. Like it definitely doesn't feel that way sometimes, but it all works out in the end. Um, and one thing I hear people say over and over and over 
um, is that they wish they had understood all of the different routes, professional routes open to them when they were a student. Some of us, I mean, I tumbled into exploration and I love it, um, even though I'm actually a survey geologist now. Um, but some people tumble into things and don't love it. So just try to make mindful choices, educate yourself and then make mindful choices about what you're doing. Also, honestly, positivity and enthusiasm go a long way. I think for a lot of us, whether we admit it or not, that might be one of the main things we look for when we're hiring because you want to look for someone that you want to work with. And I mean, there's all sorts of um, diversity, equity, inclusion, things that come into that about similarity bias and unconscious biases. Um, but in general, being a nice person is a, is, a good, um, is a good thing. So be nice, take care of one another. That's, <laughs> that's really important. And also you can be technically brilliant, but if you can't communicate that, it's not gonna matter so much. Um, so maybe you can only write, maybe you can only talk. Ideally you can do both, but definitely try and get one of those that you're comfortable communicating in. Um, and lastly, this is really, for me personally, kind of my personal piece of advice. It's really hard to predict your future self. Um, and so if you're like, well, in 15 years, I'm gonna do this. It's really hard to know what you're gonna look like in 15 years. So give yourself some flexibility. Um, I guess in some ways I feel like you can have it all, but it's really hard to have it all at one time. So your career might go through several phases. And I say this as someone who's still got like 30 years left until I can retire. So as if I completely know what I'm talking about, but even to the point that I've gotten to, um, I've seen my career go through several transitions. And I'm just gonna say this last bit about networking for you students. It's really important. It's, it's, it's not fun necessarily, but it's really important. Um, so look, I mean, in some ways, just find ways to make it bearable. I have heard from you younger students that LinkedIn is very uncool. Okay, fine. That hurts me a little bit because I now have to acknowledge that I'm apparently uncool. But also, if old people are on LinkedIn, keep in mind, old people are the ones who can help your career. So, you know, LinkedIn is is actually kind of helpful to a certain degree. If one of the things that you hate the most about networking is the awkward silences, just like read up on some industry news and then blab or something about, oh, so you know, I read about that merger between BHP trying to take over Rio Tinto again, which is not happening, just FYI, that I know of. Um, it just gives you something to fill the silences with. So, um, and I think, you know, the rest people can look at on their own. Um, and I'll just, I'll leave that there. And uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to set a timer. I have no clue how long I spoke for, but I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Yeah, no, you're good on time. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thanks for a great talk, both uh, the technical portion and the advice. I think even the slide that uh, you had about the, the three routes that we could generally go into exploration, mining, government, and academia, um, would be really helpful because I think one of the conversations that I have a lot with students is what like when people ask what are you going to do next like I don't know I don't know I don't know which route is more favorable to me or I, I like most so yeah thank you so much uh, if any of the audience members have questions uh, please drop in the chat box I'll check in with Caleb here see if there's any questions in the live audience yeah um, so I've got a question I think there might be some more but um, Stephanie, you might not have the answer to this, but is there any Indian resource at Red Dog, the zinc lead deposit up in Alaska? Hmm. I don't think so off the top of my head, but I would have to look. It might be a case of them having never looked. Um, a lot of these things, is there, is there, isn't there a resource? Um, the answer might be yes, but just no one knows. Yeah, makes sense. Just, yeah, I mean, I, I figure, I mean, Indium is very often hosted at Fowlerite. So of course, you know, that was my first thought and that's a massive deposit. So even if it was relatively low, it would, could be a potentially good resource of Indium, but yeah, yeah, might not have well, looked. And, and you know, Red Dog is gonna be almost guaranteed and not just for Indium. Red Dog is gonna be one of these sites that people are gonna look at for their um, waste rock and their tailings. People are gonna wanna look at um, like, what is the potential of going back in these? What did we miss the first time around? So, right. Right, for sure. What was your Hi. question, Larry? Uh, I've got a question if I can jump in here. Hi, Stephanie, how are you? Hi, 
Hey, Dave, how are you? It's I'm doing great. It's great. That was a great talk. I, I hope we can get copies of those slides. There's lots of lots of neat things in there for copper for me in particular, but uh, that was really good. I was glad to see that you commented on the geometallurgy aspect of it, because when I look at, with my geochemistry background, when I look at that list of all of the the metals and elements involved, you know, the first thing that goes to mind is how in the world are you ever going to get these out of the rocks? And I know in some cases they don't, right? Some of the metallurgy mm -hmm. and some of these critical minerals uh, really haven't been solved yet or to a point where it breaks open the economics of the of the deposits. But I, I guess my question is, what is really known industry in the industry, public knowledge about the geometallurgy of these various uh, minerals and metals that are that fall into these lists? I think it probably varies from a uh, commodity to commodity. So indium is pretty well understood. Scandium, I think Rio Tinto is going to start recovering scandium from titanium waste uh, at one of their plants. Um, so there are certain ones that we understand really well. And then there are some of them that I think generally none of us have like any idea whatsoever how that's sitting. Um, so uh, I think it's definitely an area open to research. Um, and But as you say, I mean, I think the best that we can do as exploration geologists who who aren't the metallurgists um, is we can try and set the stage with as much information for then handing the project to a geometallurgist and saying this is what we know so that they don't have to waste their time going back and trying to figure it out so that's, yeah I that's guess, the best I've I guess, got yeah I, I would maybe approach it a little bit differently I mean you want to go after the thing if you want to go look for something and and you think you can find something you you want to make sure that if you do find it that it's going to be economic right so I, I, I was just wondering if there's a publication out there that deals with the geometallurgy of the broad list of critical minerals and uh, what the different technology is. Where, you know, where are we at with the different uh, approaches for different, uh, the different minerals? Uh, because that, that really sets the stage. If you're a company trying to decide what commodities you're gonna go after and, and, and where to go look for those, um, then you know, I, think, I think knowing that if you find something that there's a good uh, path to making that project economic is, is a really important consideration. Yeah, I definitely see where you're coming from. Um, I, I'm sure that that is in the works, um, mm -hmm. just looking at how much money is piling into the critical mineral sphere. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I'm hopeful that that will come up soon. And yeah, I, I, I'm not strong enough in the geomet space myself to really know, but um, yeah, look forward to hearing about it. Yeah. Hopefully. Thank you. That was a great talk, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. Yeah, good it. to see you. Yeah, you too. Maybe a follow-up for that. I have a question about, I know you mentioned earlier that there's really not a fixed number of what concentration to start considering uh, as a resource for these critical metals, partly or largely because of the lack of metallurgical studies of how much we can extract. But is in the meantime, would, would it just be worthwhile to just document anything that is just say above crustal abundance? Would that be worthwhile? Since sometimes we just hit a small anomaly that's under crustal abundance and we might think that it's worthwhile documenting, but I personally, I wouldn't think that is. What are your thoughts on that? Um, so I'm thinking back about the Scott Haley article that I referred to. Scott Haley, for those of you who don't know, because he's Australia-based, he's a really um, experienced, great industry geochemist, applied geochemist. Um, and I know that, the, well, Dave, who just spoke up, there's several geochemists on this call as well. What I remember is the rule of thumb is one, one uh, what's it, what am I trying to say? One order of magnitude above crustal abundance is kind of like, uh, I might look. Two orders, of, two orders of magnitude above crustal abundance is like, okay, I'm going to pay attention. Um, now, establishing crustal abundance is obviously no mean feat because it does depend on what type of rock that you're sitting in. But um, those are the general rules of thumb. And yeah, so as far as like, what can we do right now? We have to accept that the state of knowledge about critical minerals is where it is. And there are just a lot of things we don't know. So the best that we can do is try and say what we do know. And we can just put our data forward try and make sure that it is accessible to either like say in a technical report to people who are gonna inherit a deposit or then to the industry as a whole publishing things like that. The best we can do is put our data out there and hope um, that as the knowledge in this area continues to evolve, we can then go back and revisit it easily. Uh, that's that's kind of how I see it. Um, and Dave obviously brought up some good counterpoints to that too though. That's great, thank you. Caleb, is there another question over there? Yeah, I've got a, a couple. Um, so one, if we're talking about doing 
more multi-element analyses. Do you have any, I guess, suggestions or I guess, would you recommend inserting your own like external standards in there for, you know, these more unusual things like the rare earths uh, um, and, you know, things that don't usually get analyzed by um, industry labs on like a more regular basis, um, anything like that? Um, it probably depends on the lab that you're using. These days, yeah. I feel like ALS has got a stranglehold on the geochemical analysis industry, but they also do a very good job of developing um, niche methods to kind of address these different weirdo um, explorations. What I would recommend is like putting in your own field duplicates um, to a certain extent. I mean, again, this depends on how big your project is. If you're working on a project for one of the majors, they're going to have a geochemist who's going to tell you exactly what you're putting in and when you're putting it in. If you're doing this yourself, um, putting in field duplicates, if you have a blank that you're confident in, you can put a blank in. <sighs> Purchasing your own standards, you know, uh, I would say you can probably save money on that. I, I think field duplicates would give you a better view of like the quality that you're getting. That's, uh, but again, <laughs> Again, there's lots of other geochemists on this call who could probably address that too, so. Yeah. And then uh, the other audience question, uh, or I guess more just like comment is like, you, you're talking obviously, and as we all know, a lot of these projects get passed between many different hands and um, they can be decades before something happens, but uh, hanging on to all this core, uh, that can obviously be a problem. And then, you know, core gets left out in the rain and et cetera, et cetera. So um, are there any initiatives by the Utah survey or if you know of anything by the USGS where they're trying to entice or I guess encourage more companies to donate core once they're done with it or, or something along those lines? <laughs> I feel like somebody might've set me up for that question because I'm on a rampage across the state of Utah to try and preserve our core. Uh, yes. You would not believe the state that I find core in. Like it's like I found some recently that was literally like just bulldozed into a core shed. So it's bad. Um, you know, look, I'm gonna actually put a little bit of onus on the industry on this one as well because with love, industry geologists, y'all are terrible to try and get core away from. And I don't know if it's because economic geologists were just like magpies at heart. So it's like, don't take my shiny thing, but like Newmont has exited the U.S. exploration realm and they uh, explored at Gold Hill, the project I was talking about when we were having technical difficulties. And I've been working for a year and they've agreed to give me the core and I'm still working on it a year later. So um, yes, absolutely. Almost every state would have a survey that's willing to take at least some of it. Um, I mean, we can't always house all of it, but we'll take representative pieces or holes. Um, I don't know about the USGS off the top of my head, actually, but I would imagine they have something, but just universities will take donations for teaching. Um, just please don't leave your core out in the rain. Like just talk to people. We'll find, we'll find a way for you for somewhere for it to go. It could be my garden. I don't know, man, but like, let's, let's not abandon it anymore. I think, uh, some students can, uh, relate to your magpie sentiment where we, we look for, core to study for our research and uh, sometimes it's hard to get from depending on the company. Let's see, are there any other questions in the audience? You can uh, unmute yourself or put in the chat. Uh, Stephanie, would, would you be willing to share these slides with, with uh, the yeah. group? Then, okay, and I can, uh, if you email them to me, I can disperse them out too, to the people that attended, thank you. Yeah, and if anybody um, has any questions or want to follow up, they're welcome. Uh, my contact information is on the last slide of this, so um, they're welcome to just contact me directly. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank I, you. Oh, I guess Isaac, I should put a, I should do a plug out there. Everybody, please keep in mind, SCG twenty twenty two is going to be in Denver and has a strong um, minerals of our future focus. So that being both like the gold, silver, copper, traditional metals, and also the new backwaters of the periodic table. Um, so please consider doing research or talking about your work or submitting for that conference. I think it'll be a really great opportunity to talk more about this stuff. Yeah, thank you. I totally forgot about that. But that's the, <laughs> that's the topic that we're focusing on the next conference. So many, many more of these type of talks to come. Hey, I, I don't think we have any more questions, Stephanie. Thanks for your time and appreciate you being willing to talk even though you're recovering from a cough. I know how nice that could be. <laughs> yeah, thank goodness we had already planned to do this digitally. That worked out well.
so yeah Perfect. all right thank everybody thank thank you all again so much for having me and i hope you enjoy the rest of your day thank you bye